Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to uh, share together in the Sunday school class. And we just pray that as we uh, look at your church, that we will get a better understanding as far as uh, what you would have us to do, have us to be as a, uh, as a group of believers. And so uh, we just pray a blessing of our time together in Jesus' name. Okay, we are ready for uh, the church, and um, last week we did Holy Spirit. I think there may have been a lot of people who, who missed that, and, but, or not last week, but about last time we met, and we decided that uh, COVID was winning, and we decided to take a break from uh, uh, for the holidays and for COVID and all kinds of things. So we're back at it now. Um, so we're going to be talking about the church, and so we got to get down the right place here. Get past sin and Jesus and salvation and Holy Spirit. There we go. Church. Okay. Uh, the church. So we've been studying this whole idea of uh, uh, basic theology, trying to figure out uh, where man, where God, where sin, where salvation, and now we're at the point of the church. So what is the church? Uh, the uh, actual Greek word is ecclesia that is used. It is used in, in Matthew 16, 18, Acts 8, 1, Ephesians 5, 32, and Revelation 3, uh, 22. It's also used in a, model, or in a lot of other places, I think 114 times that the word ecclesia is used as far as scripture is concerned. Uh, three times it was translated just assembly. But um, here are, are these references. In Matthew 16, uh, I tell you that you are Peter and upon this rock I will build my church, ecclesia. And so this is Jesus talking to Peter this is before uh, his death, before the new covenant, and um, so he uses the term ecclesia. In Acts 8, this is after the um, ecclesia, or the, uh, the church has been established, and so on that day, a great persecution broke out against the ecclesia in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. And, and so again, you see the, the term is used. Uh, the first time it was this body, this thing that Jesus was going to, uh, to establish. And I'm sure the apostles didn't understand it. Now they are a part of that ecclesia. They are a part of that group. Um, and Ephesians 5.32, this is a profound mystery. I am talking about Christ and the church. And so he had been talking about the relationship between husband and wife, and he compares it to the relationship of, of Christ and the church. And so again, the word ecclesia is used there. And in uh, Revelation 3.22, whoever has ears, uh, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And again, ecclesia is used. So, what does all that mean? Um, when we think of church, we think of church. We think of um, a number of things. We think of, well, I'll, uh, I'll do a little audience participation. When you hear the word church, what do you think of? Building. Building. Body of believers. Body of believers. God's house. God's house. God's house. Okay. Uh, we, we need to go beyond the idea of the building because it is the people. And so we are the people. Now, you can think in terms of a local congregation, that is a church, or you think about the church, you talk about the church worldwide, and that would be all believers, uh, that would be a part of that uh, great body of believers. But uh, as far as the origin was concerned, they didn't have a word church. And this was something that had not yet been established. So Jesus uses the word ecclesia, and that's the word that seems to be used throughout 
um, the New Testament. So, ecclesia really means called out ones or an assembly. Called out ones. It's two Greek words, called out uh, people who have been called out. A group of people, an assembly of people. And so that's why it is sometimes just translated assembly because it is talking about a, a group of people. It can refer to one congregation or different, or I mean, one church or many different churches. Uh, if you've ever had to learn or read the, uh, the Apostles' Creed, and it talks about the Catholic Church, and you say, well, how can Protestant churches uh, recite an Apostles' Creed? It talks about the Catholic Church. What's it talking about in the Apostles' Creed when it says the Catholic Church? It's talking about the universal church. And say Catholic is actually simply as a, as a word means universal. And so there is nothing uh, about it as far as the generic use of the term that means anything other than, than universal church. Uh, and so when you put a big C in front of it, then it, it refers to uh, Roman Catholicism. But uh, it is simply the idea uh, of the universal church. So we do that sometimes when we talk about the church, the ecclesia, all Christians, all body of believers. But then it also can refer to individual churches or congregations. And you see that um, a lot of times, 144 uses of the term, it's probably referring more often to the local uh, congregations or the local uh, believers. Okay. It also, in the Greek world, uh, cities had an ecclesia that could be called together for the sharing of information and promoting the news and culture of a nation. Um, this is something that I, I've just come across in the last three or four years. Um, Tim Wallingford with the uh, Center for Church Leadership out of Cincinnati. Um, this is part of their presentation. But it, it talks in terms of the ecclesia of especially um, towns or cities that were in locations that were not necessarily under the, the rule or weren't necessarily originally uh, a part of a, another nation, such as when the Greeks uh, took over a lot of places, uh, the cities that they did it were not necessarily Greek. And this is more in terms of the uh, Romans now. Romans had a lot of uh, special cities that were set up. Uh, they were under Roman rule, but they realized that they were over uh, people who were not Roman. And I'm not sure that there would necessarily have been one in Jerusalem. But in the other areas, there would have been what was known as an ecclesia. And so whenever there was news from the, king, or from the, uh, the emperor, he would call the ecclesia, the ecclesia would come out, they would meet together, and then they would share it with the rest of the, of the people who were not necessarily um, happy Romans, but they would share it with them, and they would share the culture, they would share the news, and it was their, uh, their purpose to show what the, the emperor or the empire of Rome was intended to be. And so there are a lot of people who believe that, uh, that this is why this term was used, ecclesia, because it pictures that. We are a part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Christ, and so we're the called out ones that God calls together. And then when we get together, then we share our culture with the rest of the world. The problem is, uh, the rest of the world seems to be sharing their culture with us more than we are sharing it with them. But if, if you see that picture uh, as far as the, uh, because this word is not an exclusive term that is used uh, for what we would say the church. You know, today when you say church, everyone thinks of a religious connotation. 
back then when you used the word ecclesia, which is the word that was used for church, they didn't necessarily think in terms of a religious group. It would have been a, a governmental group, or it could have been any group. Um, any group could have used that, that term. So it has become a specific term. It did not start out that way. But why did Jesus choose it, and what was the intent? The intent is the idea that we have been called out, called out of uh, an old life into a new life. So that's the, the picture, and, that, and that's the neat part about the picture. Okay. What are the pictures then uh, of the church? When you think about the church um, and you want to try to get an idea of what God intended the, uh, the church to be, what are uh, some of the pictures that you could use? And obviously, uh, Kevin has been reading ahead. No, Kevin's just that smart. But the first picture is the one that, that he mentioned, body of Christ. And so in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 12 and 13, uh, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit, so to form one body, whether Jew or Greek, or Jew or Gentile, slave or free, so that we may all uh, give it the same spirit to drink. So when you when they, it talks about the church being the body of Christ, what do you what do you picture of that? What does it mean, body of Christ? Trying you, to be, you're trying to be the hands and the feet and the mouth. Okay, so you're actually looking at a body body. And that's the picture. That the uh, that Paul is giving here in court. You know, we talk about uh, the bodies of government, the bodies of this, the bodies of that, and it doesn't necessarily refer to a human body. I think the picture that Jesus or that Paul is trying to get across here is a human body. We are uh, the body of Christ. You know, we don't know whether we're the hands, the feet, uh, the liver the uh, whatever and, and we get hung up if we try to figure all those little details out but the uh, the idea is that we're the body of Christ what is the emphasis, emphasis when it talks about being the body of Christ I think of every part of the body is, has one purpose that's to keep that body alive I mean the heart, the lungs, everything is working together for the purpose of keeping that system going and alive Okay, so the body, uh, that picture is uh, everything works together, and it's vital that we that we do work together. Along that same line is the idea of unity, uh, that we work together, but we have to be one if, if we're going to do that. And I think that's the the emphasis that Paul is trying to get across here: the unity from a standpoint that each uh, part works together, but. Uh, Mary, let's take it just a, a step farther, which I think is important because it's the idea that every part is essential. Every part works together. You know, for a long time we didn't know what the uh, the appendix was, so we just yanked it out. It's, it does have a purpose, right, Miss Morgan? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> we just don't know what it is. Okay. Because <laughs> I should have asked her ahead of time. <laughs> Also, a, a less significant part, as important as a more important. Part. Right. Uh, yeah, and you don't notice it. You don't know that until you, something happens to that less significant part. Stub your big toe, and you find out just how important that big toe is. Um, you know. So, you know, there are, there are a lot of times there is that importance. And that unity, that sense of unity that has to be emphasized. Okay. Uh, another picture is the bride of Christ. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven uh, from God prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And so this is another picture that we have. This is just one scripture. There are other scriptures that, that confirm this. 
Um, and again, like I say, this is a surface study. The, each of these pictures could be a separate study in and of themselves. Uh, I think I've got a sermon on all of them. But uh, the idea of the bride of Christ, and we are the bride of Christ, what does that uh, emphasize? I think the greatest love, at least those of us that are married, uh, the greatest love we've ever experienced is the day of our marriage when we saw the bride. <clears throat> so that's the kind of love that we ought to demonstrate. Okay, so it's the love that Christ had. Are you trying to say it's an old downhill after the? <laughs> I wasn't thinking that. <laughs> That's what I thought Joyce was uh, thinking there. Uh, you know, the emphasis is the love that is shared between Christ, the uh, the group, and his bride. Whether it's just a day or the whole marriage, but it, it is the the emphasis of love from the bride's perspective. What needs to be emphasized? Prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for husband, dressed in white, the purity. And so it emphasizes Christ's love for us, but it also should emphasize uh, the need for purity um, from us as the uh, as the bride. Um, the building of God. 1 Corinthians 3 9, where we are co workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. So, what do you think of when you think about being God's building? Another term is God's temple. I think of each one of us as a building block. Like his temple. And that's different than the body because the body emphasizes different functions. Whereas the, the building blocks simply, you know, that we are fitted together. So yes, it, it still, I think, goes back to the idea of unity and, and needing to be together and, you know, all being important. You know, if you're, if you're building a house and you leave out one brick, uh, there's going to be some cold air coming in in the wintertime. So the emphasis has to be as far as that unity is concerned. Okay. Uh, Dave, I was thinking of husband and wife again too. Doesn't the Bible say that they become one? Yes. I mean, it's two people. The uh, the oneness of oneness and purpose. And, and that's what uh, Paul emphasized in, in the uh, the five thirty two Ephesians five thirty two passage is the idea. When he's talking about husband and wife becoming one, he said, I speak to you a mystery, not about the marriage, but about uh, the uh, Christ and the church. It's that oneness. Uh, we, a lot of times we think about the, uh, the oneness in marriage as being an example of our, it's the other way around. It's our oneness in Christ becomes the example for, for marriage. But it is that, that emphasis, that, that unity. So we're coming back to unity again, even in the bride. Man, we can't get away from unity, can we? <laughs> okay. Family or household. Consequently, you're no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household. Um, you know, what, uh, what is the idea of, of, the, of the family? Uh, I think a family is someone that supports and encourages, <clears throat> helps you through hard times, celebrates on occasions. It's a support group. Well, I'm keeping it. How did you get ahead of this stuff, man? <laughs> a very good answer, even. <laughs> it is the idea of the. Uh, um, of the support that we find within a family. Yeah, you, you know families that, that do support each other and when they uh, when the support isn't there a lot of times the individuals are, are really damaged by that and so uh, you know we are a part of a household and um, I guess God's dead 
Jesus is our brother. Um, we are his children. Yeah, we're, yeah, we're fellow children with Jesus um, in that in this picture. Um, but you know, we're brothers and sisters, so that means we never fight. I mean, how many have never fought with a brother or a sister? They fight amongst themselves, but don't let anybody else be in there. That's the way the, uh, a strong family is. And that's the way it ought to be as far as the church is concerned. And that, that that's not always the case as far as the church is concerned. We have a tendency to rip each other apart and, and not defend each other. Okay. Uh, flock of God, keep watch over yourselves and also the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So here is a picture of Paul talking to the, uh, the elders from Ephesus. The emphasis here is the, uh, the elders were shepherds. And so that was uh, the picture of what a, a uh, uh, what an elder was was a shepherd, and so this is the picture that he is using. They also the picture is um, preparing them for uh, wolves in sheep's clothing that would come in. What was a wolf in sheep's clothing? Did they actually have wolves that ran around uh, putting on sheep's clothing? Was it a uh, you know, we we use it today to refer to anyone who sneaks around like that. I really believe that this may be the origin of our figure of speech. And I think it goes back to the idea that uh, that you had men at that time or, or shepherds who would put on the shepherd's clothing um, in order to go out and be among the sheep so the sheep would accept them. And so this was a, a real thing, but it was more of a shepherd in uh, sheep's clothing who was actually a wolf. Uh, and he was not really a shepherd. And so I'd like to do a little more study with regard to that but you know you, you hear you know the terminology that we use today we understand what it means and you read it here which came first I think this came first and I think there's even something beyond this that uh, would be an interesting study now one that we don't always want to talk about uh, is the idea that we are the army of God how do you feel about being the army of God For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the uh, world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretense that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought uh, to make it obedient to Christ. The picture is, and I, I, never, I guess I had thought about it to a, a minor degree, but as I was doing the research, this is one of the pictures I saw, was Army of God, read what the guy had to say, and, and had this scripture. Um, and, and I guess in this day and time we need to be careful with it. But it does emphasize the idea that we are in a spiritual warfare. Um, the devil was out there and he's trying to take us out. I mean, this is not something that, uh, yeah, it's nice to come to church. If we're in church, everybody loves us. It's one at a time. Well, you got somebody out there that doesn't want you to do that. You got someone out there that does not want you to, uh, to do what God wants you to do. And he is not an enemy that plays around but he very much so is an enemy that, uh, that attacks, that destroys. 
Uh, even when Jesus established the church, he said the gates of death or Hades uh, would not prevail against the, the, uh, the church. And so there is the, the picture there of someone trying to prevail against it. Um, and so, you know, this picture of being an army for God is not so much the idea that we go out like the Crusaders did. I'm not sure that that was a, a very positive uh, picture in the uh, uh, history of the church, but um, the idea that we have to stand for what's right, especially in our own lives, because the devil is going to try to come after us, and we need to be prepared to fight against it, which is why we have been given uh, the armor of God. Um, so the, the picture is there as long as we just uh, um, don't take it you know, too far. How many would like uh, Little House on the Prairie? Okay. You remember the very last show where they blew up the town? Because the guy came in and he owned all the property, but uh, he didn't own the uh, things that were on the property. But he owned the land, but he didn't own it. And so they blew up all their houses and all the business. You don't remember that one? It was just on Cozy TV. And I have a tape. You can come over to my... No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, um, you know, when they marched away from the building and having done all that, they were singing Onward Christian Soldiers. A little notice. Tidbit there, so we'll move on. I heard it said that on this sea of life that we're on, we're not on a cruise ship, we're on a battleship. Yep. So, what is the picture, what is the uh, uh, the purpose of the church? And I suppose um, we could simply look at it and say the purpose of the church is to fulfill the pictures of the church. You know, as a body, we are to be one. As a bride, we are to be pure. We talked um, some about this as we were going through them. The building, we are to be fit together. Family, we need to act like a family. Uh, the flock, we need to have shepherds who are overseeing and taking care of the flock. And, and the army, that we need you know, stand for, for what is truth, what is right. And so uh, the purpose of the church is to fulfill the pictures in a general sense. Uh, we also say it is to help each individual fulfill their goals. Um, each one of us should have spiritual goals. And if the only spiritual goal you have is to get to heaven, so be it. The church ought to be there to help you fulfill that spiritual goal of getting to heaven. As you grow and mature, then you realize that there are things you can do to help other people get there. But um, it is to help each other achieve those goals. And more importantly then, it is to help God fulfill his purposes. What's God's purpose? How should we say? He wants everybody saved. Now he knows that's not gonna happen, because people are gonna reject. But he also uh, has put us here with the responsibility of the Ministry of Reconciliation. So we are to be going out and we are to be saving others. So the purpose of the church is to help God fulfill his purpose, which is the idea of saving others, but also maturing others uh, so that they might become. Uh, a good passage we could have put in here is the, uh, the Great Commission, go and make disciples. Uh, and that would be the, uh, the mission of the church. There are a lot of different things. All you gotta do is go to any website of a church and look up their mission statement or purpose statement. It, it's all stated in a little different way, but the idea is uh, the purpose of the church is to save the lost and to mature the believer and to help the uh, help the world. I mean, you can say that in all kinds of different ways, but that is the essence of what being said. When I was doing this, I, I ran across this uh, passage in Corinthians, and I thought it, it kind of applied as well. It talks about the idea of watering, or planting and watering. It said, I planted, that's Paul, Apollos watered it, and God has been making it grow. So the one who 
one who waters anything, but only God who makes it grow. So what is the purpose of the church? There are some who are planters, and there are some who are waterers. And so we work together as far as sharing the gospel and getting the gospel out and watching people uh, come to know Christ. And God is the one who makes it grow. Uh, the one who plants and the one who waters has, uh, have one purpose. And they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. Whether we are co-laborers in God's service, we are God's building, or we are God's field, or you are God's field, God's building. Uh, and so I think it's a neat way for us to look at it is the fact that the purpose of the church is to is to plant as many seeds as we can and if the seed has already been planted then we need to water that seed and we need to watch it grow and mature and eventually it will harvest uh, but we are harvesters as well remember Jesus said the fields are whited to harvest pray that God uh, we'll send workers. So we we plant and we uh, water, but we also are participants in the harvest. And so we share in that harvest time. Okay, now we come to ooh, I gotta move quick here. the organization as far as the church is concerned. How is the church to be organized? Um, and so here are the four passages. Uh, Ephesians 4, uh, 11 through 13. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, pastors, the teachers uh, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity and faith in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, obtaining to the whole measure of of the fullness of Christ. So there again is another purpose of the church. I mean, if you're looking for a purpose, it, there are, it would really be hard to, again, it needs to be a separate study. But note sort of the organization. You have apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That's the way uh, that the church was established in order to be run. And Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders uh, for them in each city and with prayer fasting, committing them to the Lord in whom they had put their trust. Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ to all God's people in uh, Christ Jesus at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, the elders and the deacons. And then in, in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 12, you have uh, quali qualifications, guidelines, expectations, whatever term you want to use for elders and for deacons. So what is the organization then as far as the church today is concerned? Uh, most organizational rules and designs are by tradition. Um, I think that is important to note and when you start looking at, at churches as far as the organization is concerned, a lot of it is laid out by tradition and has uh, very little basis as far as scripture is concerned. You know, when you think about the, uh, um, you know, the Catholic Church, where is the Pope in the Bible? I don't read about a Pope. Uh, cardinals, I don't see the word cardinals in the Bible. I can do the word bishops. Um, but, you know, when they talk about deacons, they're talking about deacons, totally different than what we talk about deacons. And when we talk about deacons, we're talking about uh, a different group of people than the Baptists talk about deacons. And, and so from that standpoint, a lot of these things have simply been handed down by church tradition, and that's the way that they, that they are established. And so if we're wanting to be a church of Christ, if we're wanting to be a New Testament church, we're wanting to try to find the design as far as the New Testament is concerned. Um, but, um, it's not, I guess it's, it, to a point it should be held that we need to, uh, to die on because um, we need to understand function more than
than, than names. Um, so the first thing we see as far as the, uh, the overseers in a church are uh, elders, bishops, overseers, pastors, shepherds, and they are to oversee the church. All those terms are used for the same person. The word bishop actually means overseer. The word bishop is the uh, is the older term, and the newer translations have translated as bishop. So it's actually the same Greek word, uh, bishop and overseer. Elder speaks more to age, but it also goes back to the Jewish idea of uh, the Jewish elders. Pastors and shepherds are again the same term, and they refer to the same function. And, and again, they're probably translated the translation of the same word. And so these are the overseers as far as the church is concerned. So when you have a church, you need to have elders because that's what Paul did when he established these churches. He went back through and he made sure that they had elders. Then you have evangelist, minister, preacher, or pastor. And so these are terms used for people like me. Uh, the evangelist speaks to the idea of uh, the ones who went out and actually established churches. Ministers, again, speak more to the, uh, to the function. Preacher speaks more to the function. The word pastor is one that has come up uh, recently because um, a lot of churches refer to their ministers as the pastor because you know that's the the organizational structure that they have they are the elder and the people under them are deacons uh, for a long time you know our church has fought that and, and you know we didn't want our preachers called pastors because of the uh, the implication that it had um, i guess i've given up that fight and there are a lot of people who call me pastor and that's fine um, I would prefer a minister or a preacher, uh, but the idea, uh, and especially here at, at Delta, because I am an elder, so, you know, recognized as an elder, so that is a little different in this situation. But, uh, you know, those are the names, but the bottom line, the function is, you got someone who preaches. And we're going to quit here because I'm out of time. But uh, we will talk about deacon next time. And so the things you can think about are, uh, was this a specific office? Can a woman be a deacon? And what is the function of a deacon? So uh, come back and we'll move on. I think the next uh, topic is heaven. And the last one is a little eschatology, talk about uh, the end time. But, um, and then we'll, we'll go right into another study. I'll tell you what we're going to study next time. Next time. All right. By the way, thank you for the, the time we've had to share together. I'll be with us as we go in for a time of worship together in Jesus' name.